Minister Khan had earlier emphasised the importance of health rather than just health care. I fully support Minister's view and this is a motto that I often tell my residents, family and friends. In my experience, I found that at the heart of every issue or policy are our people. The success of a policy or program hinges upon what we can make out of it. This is especially true when it comes to health promotion initiatives. Very often, Singaporeans tell me that they would like to lead a healthier lifestyle. Many have also shared that they appreciate the government's effort to encourage them to do so. It is heartening that we have made some inroads over the past years. Dr. Teo Ho Ping and Ms. Ellen Lee asked about preventive care services for children, elderly, and in relation to mental well-being, respectively. MOH a, has a range of preventive care services for Singaporeans of all ages. We want to provide good support, especially in the early years and through childhood. This lays the foundation for good health habits to continue into adulthood. We have various programs from conception through birth and preschool. The HPV's school health services provide annual medical checkups vaccination, and oral health services. For our elderly, there are initiatives such as the Community functioning, Functional Screening Program, which aims to detect functional decline in older adults. MOH will look into introducing a vaccination schedule for adults and the elderly. Health is not just about physical health. Indeed, health promotion also needs to address mental well-being. We have mental well-being programs tailored for the different stages in one's life. There are online mental well-being scales for children and youth, as well as for adults. For the elderly, there's a mental first aid kit program that improves mental well-being through positive experiential activities. Next month, HPB will be working with the National Arts Council to roll out an arts for mental well-being. It's a program that makes use of drama and recycling art and craft. Dr. Teo Ho Pin will be happy to hear that we do measure the effectiveness and health outcomes of health promotion programs at the national level. The National Immunization Registry monitors immunization coverage for school-going children the Student Health Survey assesses key health behaviours. Regular nationwide health surveys monitor the prevalence of chronic diseases, behavioural risk factors and preventive health behaviours in adults and the elderly. These surveys, shows, these surveys show progress in many areas. However, some trends continue to be worrying. More Singaporeans are getting obese, and more young adults are taking up smoking. As we age, our risk of developing chronic diseases such as diabetes and high blood pressure increases. Doing things the same way is simply not enough. As individuals, as a government, and as a society, we need a new approach to healthy living. One way or another, healthy living should be everyone's business. It should not be something we have to think about. It should be second nature to us. Our purpose is to ensure that no Singaporean is deprived of a healthy lifestyle. To achieve this, it means first that the right environment needs to be developed throughout Singapore so that leading a healthy lifestyle is not just easy but natural for all of us. Secondly, everyone is actively engaged and aware of opportunities for living healthy lifestyles. Last but not least, adopting a healthy lifestyle need not be but the more expensive option. In summary, our vision for healthy living is to be healthy together, anytime and anywhere, through the three P's, place, people and price. We want to translate this vision into action. Earlier, Minister Gan mentioned the Healthy Living Master Plan Task Force, which I'm heading. 
We aim to develop a national blueprint for healthy living. The task force is studying the factors that motivate Singaporeans to change behaviour and to maintain a healthy lifestyle. In our discussions, we were very heartened to hear that some ideas are already being considered by various agencies for implementation. I will go into more detail later. The task force has also studied innovative practices from other cities. One inspiring example is New York. They reported a successful 5.5% decrease in childhood obesity rates from 2006 to 2011. This is after years of multi-agency efforts to improve nutrition and build environment to encourage physical activity. For example, New York requires restaurants to post calorie information on their menu boards. They also came up with active design guidelines to create healthier buildings, streets and urban spaces. Learning from such examples, we aim for similar success in Singapore. Staying healthy concerns every one of us. During a recent Our Singapore Conversation session, one of the participants, Madam Rohani, provided much inspiration. She told us about how she prepares healthy snacks such as carrots, cucumber sticks and cherry tomatoes for her grandchildren. They also exercise together as a family at least once a week. This is a fine example of how we as individuals, families and as part of the society can encourage one another to live healthily. I was encouraged that there was strong support among participants for a healthier lifestyle. Therefore, Healthy Living Master Plan is about making connections at three levels. Firstly, across government. Secondly, it's about connections across communities. Thirdly, between communities and the government. We hope to strengthen these connections so that everyone gets involved in working towards a common good. This involves initiatives that cover the place, the people and the price or the three P's. Let me share with members in more detail. Firstly, the police element of the master plan involves changing the physical environment that we live in so that we can go about our daily activities in a healthy way without even thinking about it. Ms. Faiza Jamal asked about access to nature spaces as a health promotion measure. We know that Singapore has limited land, yet we have innovatively maximized the use of spaces where natural or man-made for physical activities to promote healthy lifestyle. We have designed our built environment to promote healthy living. Ministry of National Development, Ministry of Transport and other infrastructure agencies have also contributed to the health agenda. Our housing estates are designed to encourage residents of all ages and abilities to go outdoor for fresh air, exercise and even gardening. These estates have facilities such as parks, park connectors, playground and cycling parks. With the right infrastructure for physical activity in place, the next step is to experiment with programs and micro-design such as innovative signage. As such, we will be working with town planners and government agencies to create visual cues in public spaces to prompt physical activity. For example, you will see more exercise maps and appealing visual designs to encourage the use of stairs at workplaces, shopping malls, schools and public places like train stations. By connecting the dots between the different ministries and agencies and the community, we are all working together to achieve the common goal of good health for our people. Singaporeans. A conducive environment for healthy living also includes food establishments. One example is the Healthy Hawker Centre initiative. I am pleased to say that the pilot was a res resounding success with up to a 30% increase in sales of whole grain and with the hawkers reporting a 20% increase in business. During our Singapore conversation sessions, some of us were asked why can't you scale up 
healthier hawker centre faster. They said, we want it in our neighbourhood too. I'm pleased to say that healthier hawker centres will be extended to 40 more hawker centres, <coughs> food courts and coffee shops in financial year 2013. For greater impact, we are also reaching out to centralised kitchen that supply workplace canteens, coffee shops and household ten-cut meals to use healthier ingredients. The target is to reach out to five centralised kitchens, supplying more than 50,000 meals a day by end of financial year 2013. Dr Lam Pimin will be glad to know that we have similar initiatives in our schools. More than 90% of our schools subscribe to healthy eating guidelines under the Healthy Eating in School programs. As Mr. Heng Chi Hao had emphasized, healthy living should also occur in workplaces. Employers are realizing more and more now that health is very much linked to productivity at work. We have a comprehensive health promotion support infrastructure for companies such as the Workplace Health Promotion Grant and Capability Building Causes. The Healthy Living Master Plan Task Force visited an SME called UMW Equipment and Engineering Private Limited. We wanted to learn firsthand how an SME can use their limited resources to build a strong health-promoting workplace culture. I found that their philosophy, a healthy worker, it's a safe worker to be a good start. Some of the F staff got together to form Workplace Health Executive Committee that plans and drives health promoting initiatives. In order to encourage active participation, many of these programs are free and held during office hours. They even have a small gym for employees. This is a good example of how a company and its workforce come together to take ownership of their health. Some industries that employ many low-wage workers, such as the cleaning and security sectors, have limited access to health programs. We have not forgotten about them. As such, I am pleased to announce that HPB will collaborate with NTUC to reach out to workers from these sectors to offer health screening and follow-up services. Next, the people element of the master plan has two aspects. First, it means to be inclusive of all segments of society, especially the vulnerable groups such as those with lower income, the youth and the elderly. Secondly, the people element also means improving people's understanding of health or health literacy so that we can make informed choices about how we live and how we eat. As part of reaching out to all segments of society, HPB will ramp up its ground-up movement. One key enabler is getting ordinary citizens, our health ambassadors, to champion health promotion within their respective communities. To date, HPB has trained and deployed nearly 5,000 health ambassadors since 2011. We target to have 10,000 health ambassadors by 2015. Some of the stories of how these health ambassadors have made an impact on their loved ones are very encouraging. One of such is Madam Pei, Lake Kim, a 55-year-old senior health ambassador, shared that she first became a health ambassador because she started to realize the importance of maintaining health as she ages. She then thought about her family and felt compelled to keep them healthy too. As she became more active in HPB events, she started encourage, encouraging her friends to adopt a healthy lifestyle as well. She has also used a persuasive skill to counsel people who come for screening at community screening events to go for medical follow-up. This is the very attitude towards health and the community that we hope will become pervasive through our Health Ambassador Network. The other aspect of, people, of the people element is about improving health literacy. We can shape food choices by more clearly labeling 
the nutritional content of what we are buying. Last month, that is on the 7th of February, HPB announced that all products with healthier choice symbol, HCS in short, will also have to carry the guideline daily amount, GDA, labeling on the front of their packaging. These labels will better guide consumers on the amount of calories, fat, salt, and sugar that are contained per serving, hence enabling consumers to make better informed choices. HPB has garnered the support of major multinational companies in this regard and will continue to work with the food industry on this initiative. Our goal is that by 2014, all HES products will carry this GDA labeling to be followed thereafter by non-HCS products. We will also provide better guidance on how much we eat. Today, HPB Healthy Diet Pyramids shows us the recommended number of servings of each type of food group. However, more Singaporeans are exceeding their recommended daily intake of fat and carbohydrates as compared to a few years ago. This means that we still need to understand what the right proportion size actually looks like. We will therefore shift from the current healthy diet pyramid to healthy plate. The healthy plate will visually link nutrient requirements to the recommended portions that should be consumed in a meal. Last but not least, we come to the price element of the master plan. We cannot be inclusive of all segments of a society if we do not make healthy living affordable. We agree with Dr. Lam Pin Min, Dr. Li Lin Yeo, Dr. Teo Ho Pin, Mr. Heng Chi Hao and Dr. Chia Shi Lu that we should look at how to better incentivize healthy living. We are open to exploring some good ideas that you have suggested. For example, Dr. Chia mentioned tax rebates or discounts for those who participate in wellness programs. Also, volunteers who help promote healthy lifestyle, such as health ambassadors, can be given expanded recognitions and benefits. Dr. Lam also suggested insurance rebates for those who can demonstrate that they are living out healthy lifestyle. We will study various feasible incentives, including those tied to insurance premiums. It is equally important that as individuals, we ourselves are motivated to live healthily. We also agree with Dr. Lam on the need for affordable, healthier food options. HPB has worked with the ingredient suppliers and store vendors in the Healthy Hawker Centre program to make sure the healthier dishes offered are affordable. HPB also partners major supermarket chains to offer regular promotions of healthier products at discounted prices. We are also working with local R&D institutions and the food industry to build capacity to produce affordable and healthier foods and beverages. Next, we need to address affordability for screening. Screening enables early detection and treatment of diseases. Yet I appreciate that for many of us, finances are sometimes tight. We have to attend to the basic necessities first and we not even consider spending on screening, especially if we feel okay. Others may be worried not so much about the cost of screening, but more about the financial costs and affordability of treating a condition should one be diagnosed. We are therefore focusing our screening outreach on the groups of people who need help most. To this end, the task force recently visited the Henderson Senior Activity Center, SAC, run by the Taihawakwan Moral Society. We wanted to understand the voluntary welfare organization outreach work and the issues that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. I was struck by how the SAC's program helped give the elderly residents a greater purpose in life and motivated them to enjoy better physical independence and mental well-being. 
I enjoyed talking to the seniors and in fact I learned a lot from this engagement and how we can better our engagement Singaporeans to enhance their lifestyle and towards a, a healthier life. However, I ask myself, can these programs be even more effective if different organizations get together to implement them? I'm de therefore happy to announce that such public-private connections are already being made. HPB's Pilot Senior Holistic Engagement Program, SHEP in short, will bring health programs to lower-income seniors through connecting with VWO partners and SAC platforms. It will tap on HPB's expertise and the reach and passion of VWOs to provide free promotion, free health promotion programs and subsidize health screening initiatives. Lastly, in response to Dr. Lam's questions on vaccination, we have an expert committee on immunization, ECI in short, which advises MOH on which vaccines to include in the National Childhood Immunization Schedule, NCIS in short. This is based on factors such as how common or serious the disease is and the availability of safe and effective vaccines. Dr. Lam will be happy to hear that we'll be adding the vaccine against Haemophilus influenza type B, or HIP for short, into the NCIS. We appreciate Dr. Lam's concern that increased connectivity and movement of people across borders heightens the risk of local outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases. Our strategy is to ensure high local vaccination coverage to protect our residents. Vaccination coverage has been maintained at above 95% in Singapore. To improve affordability for childhood vaccinations for Singaporeans, I'm pleased to announce that the five-in-one combination vaccine will be available for free at the polyclinics. This vaccine covers hip, diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, and polio. We will also introduce free hepatitis B vaccination at the polyclinics. In addition, we will allow MediSafe use for all vaccinations recommended on the NCIS up to a cap of $400 per MediSafe account, be it in the public or private sector. We will soon provide the public with a schedule of preventive health services that apply from birth till old age that includes screening and immunization. As part of our commitment to preventive care, we would like to consult the public on how we can make it more accessible and affordable. I have shared some initial thinking and ideas today. The master plan is still under development. We hope to touch the hearts and minds of Singaporeans and gather ideas on how we can together achieve a healthier lifestyle. As such, the Ministry will be holding a public consultation on the Healthy Living Master Plan in the coming months. Please give us your ideas and feedback. Madam, most people know the common taglines. We should be active, eat wisely, be happy, not smoke, and attend health screening. Saying it is the easy part. Translating it into action requires a radical change in our mindset. We hope that you will join us in this journey to be healthy together anytime and anywhere. Thank you.